Konusti, how are you? Welcome to the Candlelit Tales podcast and welcome to the third and final week of our collaboration with the Embers Collective, Echoes. This week again you're going to hear two stories, one from the Embers Collective and then after that a story from Irish myth chosen by one of our storytellers. We'll talk about these stories all at once in a post-show special at the end of the month, so keep an eye on our social media for details. Now settle in for a story that is not for the faint of heart. You might think you know it, but Lonan will tell you a tale of sleeping beauty you might not be expecting. They say the day she was born was one of the most joyful days the kingdom had ever seen. The king and queen had tried for so long to have a baby and now they had their beautiful little girl. And they named her Talia. Growing up, Talia had all the love and support and care that a young princess would ever need. And her parents were very protective. They wanted to make sure that nothing would ever happen, no harm would ever fall on their little girl. So they had anything that might cause her harm or injury locked away. All the knives, all the scissors, even the sewing machine was put away. She was allowed no pets and no animals, and they never let her leave the walls of their great castle. So Talia spent her days wandering around the castle, looking into all of the rooms, hiding under beds, walking around in their huge gardens. One day, she found a door, a door which she had never seen before. She didn't even know where it led to, what this part of the castle was. And she tried it, and the handle turned, and the door creaked gently open. Her heart was racing. She wasn't sure if she was doing anything wrong. Something told her that she was, but she was driven forward, step by step by step. What would mommy and daddy say? Step by step by step, she made her way up into the great tower, and at the top, Something was hidden under a great big sheet. She grabbed the sheet and she pulled it hard, flicking dust up into the air. And there was something that she had never seen before. A great big wooden wheel with a long piece of string. She touched the wood. It was cold. And her heart was beating faster in her chest. She ran her finger gently along the string and... Oh! She looked at her finger as a line of blood began to appear and ran and dripped onto the floor. And that was the last thing she saw. Her parents searched everywhere for her, looking in all of the rooms, running around the gardens, calling her name. And then they came across the door which stood slightly ajar, and their hearts almost stopped in their chest. I thought you locked it, I thought you locked it, they said. They ran up the stairs and they saw her lying on the ground and they saw the blood on her finger. They lifted up her body, and they brought her down into her room, and they lay her out in her bed, and no matter how much they shook her or called her name, she wouldn't wake up. And so they waited. Every day they sat by her bed, crying, calling her name. Every doctor and witch and magician came from all over the land to try to help her. But she never woke up. And as happens, her parents grew old, 
and still they sat by their bed until the end of their days. And seasons came and went. Wars were fought and lost and won. Monarchs rose and fell. Many, many years later, when the walls of the castle had almost completely crumbled away, one such monarch was out hunting with his falcon in the middle of the woods. He watched as his falcon flew far up ahead of him into a dark patch of the trees and wouldn't return when he called for it. So he drove his horse on riding towards the dark patch in the woods and he found a great crumbling old wall wrapped in ivy. He'd never seen this before. He didn't know that there were any buildings on his land. He made his way around until he came to a great wooden door which sat slightly open. Walking down inside, he saw his falcon up ahead flying down a corridor and he followed it. He followed it all the way up a flight of stairs and down another long corridor, passing the crumbling grey walls. It was dark and damp in there. The walls had long been overtaken by the plants and the ivy. The trees had kicked and punched their way through. And he came to a door which was shut. He turned the handle and with his shoulder shoved the door open. And to his surprise, he was in a room that looked like it had just been decorated the day before. Pink walls, plush carpets, and deep purple curtains, and the walls were not crumbling and dusty like they were out in the rest of the castle. And on the bed lay a sleeping beauty. He looked at her soft skin, her beautiful hair, and he fell in love with her. He made his way over to the bed and he called gently into her ear, Wake up! Wake up! He shook her shoulders, but there was no response. So he kissed her, first on the cheek and then on the lips, but she didn't wake up. So then he made love to her. Or at least, that's what he told himself he was doing. And that's what he told himself he was doing again and again when he returned time and time again to make love to her. Where are you going, my husband? his wife would ask. Hunting, he would tell her. But he never seemed to come home with anything. The queen began to grow suspicious and she was asking her husband all sorts of questions so he decided that he would bring his love affair to an end. But he would go see his sleeping beauty one last time. So he made his way out to that dark patch in the forest where the building stood, not knowing that this time he was being followed. The queen watched her husband walk into those crumbling walls and she followed him down the corridor and she followed him silently up the steps. She watched as he went into the room and she heard him with her and she stood in the darkness as she watched him leave she made her way into the room and saw the young girl lying on the bed a rage burned in her chest and she thought about all the things that she would do and say to her. She ran over and shook her shoulders. She screamed and shouted in her ears. She slapped her around the face harder than she probably needed to. But the young girl didn't wake up. And the queen's stomach turned. 
she realised what her husband had done. And that knot in her stomach grew even tighter when she saw that the young girl was pregnant. The queen raced back to the castle and she sent a nurse out into that patch in the woods to that crumbling, decaying old building and she told the nurse to tell no one. But that nurse was to look after her, take care of her, and when the babies were born she was to look after them too. And if the young girl ever woke up, she was to send for the queen immediately. And that's what the nurse did taking care of the young girl and when the babies were born the young girl still did not wake up she gave birth to twins and the nurse would place them on her breast so that they could feed still she never woke up and one day one of the babies lifted her hand and took the finger that had been cut by the thread all those years ago and began to suck on it. And something stirred and moved and the young girl's eyes began to flutter as she opened and she took a deep breath in. She looked around the room which was so familiar and then she looked down and saw two babies. Ba babies. 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 And she screamed. The nurse came running in when she heard that scream and she saw the young girl was awake. She calmed her down and held her head and sent for the queen. The queen sat with the young girl. She told her everything that had happened, what her husband had been doing all this time, and the young girl cried. And she sobbed and she screamed and she curled up in a fetal position and she beat the floor with her fists. And the Queen stayed with her through it all. And when the young girl had cried until she could cry no more, the Queen said, My love, I have a plan. The King sat in his study late at night, candle burning next to him as he wrote very important letters to send out all around the kingdom giving his orders. He heard a strange sound outside, like the clattering of wood. And he made his way downstairs to find that all the lights in the castle had been turned out. And in the middle of the courtyard was a huge pile of wood. And around that huge pile of wood stood the women of the kingdom with flaming torches in their hands. And in the middle of them all stood his wife, her face lit by the torchlight. My queen, he said, what is the meaning of all of this? Ah, my lord, tell me, what would you do, so wise and just, if someone crept into our house in the middle of the night while we slept and took something that wasn't theirs. Well, in that case they would be a thief and, and I would cut off their hands. Very well, my lord, so wise and just. And what would you do if that person did so repeatedly, again and again broke into our house and took something that wasn't theirs? Well, 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 in that case, they, they didn't learn the lesson the first time. I, I would sentence them to death. Very well, my lord. So wise and just. You see, I was out riding the other day and I found a young girl living on our land, stealing from us. 
shall we sentence her to death? Yes, absolutely. If she was living on our lands and stealing from us without our permission, absolutely. Very well, my lord. And what about her two children? And the queen watched as the king's face turned pale. His legs seemed to turn to jelly, and as she stepped aside, behind her stood Talia, a baby in each of her arms. She stared at the king. My lord, you repeatedly broke into my house, and you repeatedly took something that wasn't yours, and now, by your own ruling, said Talia, you must die. The king began to blubber and shout, begging and pleading, but his legs had gone from under him as the women half carried, half dragged him up to the top of the pyre and they tied him to a great big post. And they lowered their flaming torches. And as the flames rose up, licking and snaking around his feet, around his legs, around his chest and arms as the smell of burning hair and skin filled the air. And as his screams echoed out into the dark, dark forest, Talia and the queen held hands, a baby in each of their arms, and they knew that they would live happily ever after. Sheen picked up on the dark undertones of this fairy tale story and the eventual triumph of the woman wronged that we don't always hear about. This story was framed for many years as a warning for why a man should never trust a woman. Because when the daughter of a king is kidnapped and forced to marry a powerful sorcerer against his will, what else but the fickleness of a woman's heart could possibly explain why she would betray his secrets and orchestrate his death? What indeed? We'll see. You've probably heard the phrase a rare beauty or a rare Irish beauty, but not all the rare Irish beauties came from the island of Ireland. Some of them were from the other world and had been born into the godlike tribe of the Tuatha de Danann. You see, a war had been fought and the land had been divided. It was decided that the mortals would stay on the island of Ireland. And Mananon MacLear arrived on Scoob Tunna and used his magical silver branch to create the veil between this world and the other world. And just off the northeast coast of Ireland, there was an island called Inish Fair Falga, and from this island, stories of a rare Irish beauty with three magical cows that pulled a cauldron of plenty had broken away and started to travel on the road. And as stories travel, they grow. So by the time these stories reached down in Macca, there was nothing for it but to crave Rua to organize a ton to go to Inish Fair Falga and see for themselves these magical cows and bring them back to their king. They had one problem, however. Not one of the crave Rua knew how to get to the other worlds. They did not know how to break through the veil. So they sent out word looking for a druid. 
A short time passed, and a huge, gnarled-looking, grey, old, wizened man arrived up at Owen Maka and offered to guide the Crave Rua to Inish Fair Falga in exchange for an equal share of the spoils of the raid. A small band was assembled and they set sail across the waves and through the vale. The town itself was a rout and when the captain asked who had fought and who had won, each of the Crave Rua answered, myself and the old grey man, but when it came to divide the spoils, the old grey man demanded half of everything, as he had fought half of the battles and won all he had fought. And when this was denied, he grew angry and seemed to grow larger and more powerful and more menacing. Suddenly he moved almost too fast to see and scooped up the three cows, the cauldron of plenty, and grabbed Blonnet for his prize, the youngest warrior of the Crave Ruin. He was the only one that tried to stop the druid from taking Blonnet, but the giant druid, he just drove the pup into the ground up to his shoulders, shaved his head, and left him with a cap of cowshite as he cast a spell and disappeared back through the Vale to Ireland. Blonnet was a rare creature in a strange land with no friends, no family and no way home. But the land was beautiful and it would hurt her not to enjoy it, so she enjoyed it. And her three magical cows were with her, and she tended to them as she had on Inish Fair Falga, and found happiness with her daily life. She was pleasant to all and any that she conversed with, for it would simply hurt her to be unpleasant. Yes, she was kidnapped. She was trapped. Every night the druid left his fortress enchanted, such that no exit nor entrance could be seen, leaving it impenetrable till the dawn's light. In the morning when the druid would arrive back, she would have a meal prepared. She would bathe him. She would ask him about his travels and he would tell her of his search for the fair fire, the truth of men. He told her how he shapeshifted and conducted tests, such as a beheading test, that did not kill him. At this, Blonnet seemed worried and asked him why he would take such a risk. And he told her the secret spell that he had cast that he had enchanted his soul into a golden apple that could only be cut with his own sword and was hidden in the belly of a salmon that only appeared once every seven years in the Sleeve Mish Mountains. And Blonnet seemed relaxed now. She was happy and soon afterwards they were married. Again, Blonnet did not want to marry the druid, but she had nowhere to go, and why would she make herself miserable, being miserable? conversations that they had were not the conversations that she wanted to have, but why would she make them unpleasant? Then she would not enjoy herself, and she wouldn't get the information that she wanted. To the druid, Blonnet seemed happy and content with her life, and happy and content with her marriage. Every morning she listened with great interest to the stories that he brought back from his search. And about a year later, 
a message arrived from Ewan Maka that he was to choose the champion among three of the warriors of the Crave Rua. And as the evening drew close, he made ready the test for the warriors. He left Blonnet as the host and went away on his travels. When the three warriors arrived, Blonnet recognized the innocent young face of the only warrior that had tried to save her from this awful fate back on Inish Fair Falga. His hair had grown back. It was a magnificent tricolored mane down his back. And his eyes seemed to sparkle with magic. And when those magical eyes made contact with hers, it was like the whole world disappeared. They were both immediately enthralled. Whilst the other champions were being tested, Blonard had time to talk to the young warrior. She told him the secrets of the druid. She told him how the druid had enchanted his soul into a golden apple. She told him that that apple was in the belly of a salmon that would appear in the Schlievmish mountains at the next full moon. She told him that the apple could only be cut with the druid's own sword. And she told him of how when the druid falls asleep after telling her his stories of travel, that she would pour milk into the river as a signal that the young warrior could approach on the morning after the next full moon. As the druid lay in his bed, he told Blonnet of how when he travels to the other side of the world the people there call him Svigator and he told them of their strange traditions and customs this morning she inquired as to their clothes their jewelries and asked that she, he might bring her back a gift the next time And as the druid drifted off happily to sleep, she gently picked up his sword and carried it down to the river, along with her three cows and a cauldron full of milk. When the young warrior came, she handed him the sword. Blonnet could see the druid's men approaching the fortress. She cast a spell on the valley walls then, such that they would dance in front of mortal men's eyes, and led him up to the druid's room. At the top of the tower in the magical fortress on the west of Ireland, high above the angry ocean and sharp jagged rocks below. And just before the young warrior cut the druid's soul out of that golden apple, she leaned over and whispered into his ear, You're free now. And the druid screamed, but it was too late. With one swift movement, the young warrior sliced the golden apple in two, and the powerful druid crumbled to dust. They could hear then the sound of weeping coming from the corner of the room. The druid's men were lost in the valley outside, 
Ferchtina, the Druid's poet, was whimpering about the betrayal of its master and how women should never be told secrets and of the dangers of loving a rare beauty. Suddenly, with a scream of anguish and betrayal, Ferchtina rushed across the room, grabbed Blonnet about the waist with such force that it broke her ribs and threw them both out the window, plunging them down to their deaths on the rocks below. A momentary haze before the ocean swallowed them for all eternity. And just at the foothills and valleys below Cahir Conri, that magical enchantment can still be seen as the valley walls dance before mortal men's eyes, a rare beauty that couldn't be erased from time. This podcast was edited by Oshin Ryan, Rory O'Shea and the Embers Collective. Stories were by Lonan Jenkins and Oshin Ryan. You can find more about Candlelit Tales on our website, candlelittales.ie and more about the Embers Collective on their website, theemberscollective.com. You can also find them and us on all the usual social media outlets and make sure you check out the Embers Collective podcast on your favourite podcast player. Liking and subscribing to channels really helps us grow and helps them grow. So please give a like and a share and a follow and a subscribe anywhere you find them and us on social media. If you'd like to chip in a few bob for more direct support, you can find us at patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales or make a one time donation through the PayPal button on our website. We love to hear back from you with questions and requests, so please feel free to contact us directly or leave your questions in the comments below. If anything struck you about this, remember we'll be talking to the Embers Collective later this month. So let us know what struck you and we'll bring it up with the guys. What we really want to do is get these stories out there and share them with as many people as possible. So anything you can do to help us, we really appreciate. And we really appreciate you listening.